Well, good evening. My name's Martin Frith and wanted to welcome all of you to this evening's joint webinar training for Humanist Canada and Ontario Humanist Society officiants. Tonight's webinar is on special rituals. Now the webinar will be 90 minutes in length and uh, it's gonna be broken up into three portions. Uh, you'll hear from three of our finest presenters, uh, Tibby Johnson from Ontario Humanist Society, Andre Lachance from Ontario Humanist Society and Ruth Henrik from Humanist Canada. After each of their sections, there'll be an opportunity. We have set aside about five minutes for questions that may be immediate and uh, for each of those sections. And then at the end, we'll have a longer Q&A period. Um, on behalf of the wet tonight's webinar team, I'd like to turn it over to our first presenter, Tibby Johnson. So I would like to uh, welcome all of you. And I don't know if any of you have been to uh, opening ceremonies or Indigenous ceremonies across the country or across Ontario, but quite often you will hear the word uh, smudge. Uh, personally, I don't use that word because uh, it goes back uh, to non-Indigenous, uh, non-respectful ways of describing um, a ceremony that is uh, precious to the First Nations. So in my language, which is Anishinaabe, we call that um, Bopsa or Bopsawin. So you'll see that often when you go to a ceremony you'll often see it in a bowl. And one of our traditional and cultural symbols is an eagle feather. We'll have the sacred medicines, usually sage, when we light our, our bops. And the purpose of this, a lot of people don't know what it means. A lot of people don't uh, feel they can participate or ask questions. Whenever I do this at a ceremony, I always, unless it's a wedding ceremony, then you know, there's, not enough, there's no questions and answers there, but uh, I encourage people to ask questions. I welcome people to step back if they don't wanna participate. And I welcome people just to, to observe, to, to relax and to know that there's no right way or no wrong way of doing this. We start with, uh, acknowledging the four directions of Mother Earth. And that's what I would like to do this evening is to acknowledge all of you from the four directions of Mother Earth. I actually haven't got this one lit, but that's what we do for the, uh, each, each direction. Also, this symbolizes and acknowledges the colors of all of us. We come from all different directions from our mother and we acknowledge all of that. I always do that in my ceremonies to acknowledge the four directions and all of the colors and all of you who have come here to Turtle Island, our territory, to, to live together and to work together and to, to have ceremonies together. So that is the purpose of, of doing this. What we also do with our BOPS ceremony is you'll see people that bring the, the smoke to their eyes and to their ears. And if you wonder what they're actually doing is we're, we're bringing that medicine to cleanse our eyes so that we can see clearly. We bring that smoke and that medicine to our ears so that we can hear well. We bring that smoke to our mouth so we can speak well or not to speak when we should be listening. We also bring that smoke to our heart so that we have open minds, open hearts, so that we can share with one another in a respectful manner. So if those of you who are wondering what the purpose of this is, like I said, I, we often use sage, but there's other, other um, medicines that we do use. And you're all welcome to participate in this and to ask whoever is doing the ceremony at the end 
or if they say you can ask questions at any time, please ask questions. And the person conducting the ceremony is more than happy to share that part of the ceremony with you. For our land acknowledgements, I want you all to be aware that those land acknowledgements needs to come from yourselves. It's not to come from a, an Indigenous person where you ask them to do the land acknowledgement. The land acknowledgement is for the, the settlers and the newcomers to Turtle Island, to Canada, to acknowledge that you are on Indigenous territory. So it's up to you to do the research as to what territory you are from and what ceremonies the local people, the local Indigenous people offer or provide. And there's a lot of different ways that you can find out who lives on that territory or whose territory it is that you are on. For myself, I am on my own First Nation. I'm speaking from my own First Nation community right now, Neoshi Nigaming. So I would acknowledge that I am living in my own territory. And if I'm doing a marriage ceremony in my territory and the couple have asked me to do the acknowledgement, I would acknowledge, and uh, I've done this uh, over at Ruth, Ruth lives very close to me. So we've done that over at uh, her place as well, to acknowledge that we are in the territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. And one thing that we would do in acknowledging that myself in my own territory is to let you know that Neoshinaming is an unceded territory and that this territory has never been surrendered. So every single territory across Canada is all different. They all have different treaties. They are all have different ceremonies. They all have different languages. So you should never ever assume that the person that you are dealing with, the community you're dealing with, is, is just a, a blanket um, Indigenous community who may not do this. They may not, they may not do this kind of ceremony. You cannot assume that they all do that. It's up to you in the territories where you are working or where you are performing ceremonies to find out where those people are from. It's up to you to to seek out the knowledge keepers, to seek out elders, to find out how to do that land acknowledgement and to do it respectfully. And that's also going to give you an opportunity to learn where you are residing or where you are working or where you are performing the ceremony. It also lets the, the people know that you are working with, the couple or the families who you are working with, acknowledge that they are on Indigenous territory uh, throughout Canada. And this can be a way of reconcilia reconciliation, a way of learning, and a way of, of um, building relationship, relationships with the Indigenous community. There's a lot of different ways to find out. And uh, I think that we've got some links uh, at the end that you can if you don't know what territory you're on or you're going to a different city or or you're going to a different province and you want to know where which territory you're going on there's a lot of different ways you can find out uh, one fancy little um, way to find out believe it or not is an app so i have an app right here on my phone and it is called whose land and I looked at mine earlier, and, and what it does is it, bring, it links you all throughout Canada, whichever community that you're closest to, you go onto that link, and there will be a land acknowledgement from a person from that specific community. They will speak in their language, they will introduce themselves in their language, and they will help you to provide that information when you're doing a land acknowledgement when you are, are at one of your ceremonies. So one of our traditions uh, with the Anishinaabek where I am from is our one of our wedding ceremonies is to do a blanket ceremony. So often we do a blanket ceremony. We invite the parents to bring a, a blanket and it's sometimes it, it's a family heirloom 
a wedding blanket. Sometimes it's a new blanket. It, it's up to the family, whatever they want to do. So I just want to read uh, one that I had done recently. And I always ask the couple if they have somebody in the family that wants to do the ceremony or if they would like me to do it. And it just depends on what, what the family would like. So a blanket ceremony I did recently, they used a family quilt. And so the parents, uh, both sets of parents, or the grandparents, or the uncle, whatever, whoever uh, has a meaningful relationship with the couple. Uh, and then for this particular one I read, the blanket symbolizes a strong union of many interwoven strands from Jane's and John's heritage and lives. Today, as their parents place this blanket around them, we are reminded of the love they share. This blanket symbolizes that Jane and John move forward in their lives together with warmth, shelter, and security. It also symbolizes that this blanket can be a soft place, a soft resting place, can be used by one or shared by both, yet also lets breath through its fibers, allowing John and John a space to grow as individuals and as a married couple. So that's just one of the ceremonies that we do on my territory. The other one that we do on my territory is very traditional is tying of the sleeves. And it's a very simple ceremony. It's as simple as that. And, but a lot of people also like the, um, the hand tying ceremony. And what I've done also is, um, I'm, I also have uh, some Métis, heritage on my mother's side. So I do have my Métis sash where I've used that for a, um, a, a hand uh, tying ceremony um, or to tie the, the, um, the sleeves together. So there's a lot of different ones, but it's, you also have to find out from your couple if you are marrying a, uh, an indig indigenous couple or one of the uh, one of the partners is Indigenous, to find out what their traditions are, what they would like, and who can do that part of the ceremony within your wedding ceremony. They may have an elder, they might have a grandparent. It's also important to ask them also if they would like part of it done in their own language and to ask who can do that. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Uh, one of the other symbols that I do use is uh, we can bring a, a braid of sweet grass into the ceremony. And sometimes I, I use this in reference to uh, the wedding rings. If they want a wedding ring that it's, it's braided and it's got no, no beginning and no end. Um, and how strong it is, like the strong bond of the couple. Uh, there's just, there's so many beautiful ceremonies out there, but remember that they're all individualized to that specific community and to ask first and to not assume that, that it's going to be the same in my community or even um, near Toronto that, that might have some communities that may be Anishinaabek, like myself, but who have different ceremonies. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, if I have more time, I don't know what else um, I've brought here to show you, but uh, there are some links at the end and I will be open for questions. Thanks. Miigwech. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Tibby. So we do have a few minutes for questions now, uh, if anybody has them. And uh, I think what we'd be able to do if you wanted to put up your hand and we could open up the microphone for you and uh, you could ask them directly. Uh, Tibby, I had one um, and it wasn't something, could you describe for us uh, or just, I, we often hear uh, a reference to Turtle Island. Uh, could you explain the reference to Turtle Island? So Turtle Island is the, is Canada. So that's why we, we you'll hear that 
quite often is that's what we call it is Turtle Island. So our story is about the creation of uh, this, this island and it was built on a turtle's back. We've got some really beautiful legends uh, about how this, our beautiful country was developed and built on the back of a turtle. So that's why it is called Turtle Island. One thing I'm going to mention too, which I, wanted to is when we do our wedding ceremonies and we talk about what humanism is uh, I want to often mine when I'm working with uh, indigenous people I'll just read one of my openings just so you can see how it how how it relates to indigenous uh, culture and humanism is I read uh, humanism is an ethical philosophy of life very much in balance with the Anishinaabe beliefs that we are all part of the human family from the four directions on Mother Earth. Humanism and the early Anishinaabe are non-religious, which encourages us to live in equality and respect of one another and all living beings. And you you pretty much have the general idea of, uh, of how you describe yourselves when you're doing that ceremony. But uh, I always always relate it to our culture and that we have those same fundamental beliefs of equality and respect of our people who walk on Mother Earth and the beings, our animals, our, our plants and our water. Okay. Well, thank you. How's that for the long answer about, my, about Turtle Island? Uh, very helpful. Thank you. Um, Okay, so there are no other questions at this point. Uh, so if we could turn to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Tibby, and we'll look forward to uh, questions later in the, in the webinar. So for our next speaker, Andre Lachance. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about a, a few rituals that I've had some experience with. I wish Tibi would go on for another half hour because that was so fascinating. Thank you so much. So um, what I usually do when I meet a couple is uh, present them with a uh, template, a draft ceremonial that's already been customized with their names and they're given a bunch of options about what kind of readings they would like and <clears throat> that sort of things. But I also draw their attention to this document, which I give them, which was prepared by Gail McCabe some years ago. And it's just a list of all kinds of readings and also some rituals. And I would say about one couple out of 10 will go to the rituals and pick out something that they like. And that's how I find out about those rituals because I didn't know about any of them beforehand. So the first one I wanna talk about is sand mixing. I'm not going to read all these uh, texts with you, but there's just to show you what the text uh, looked like. The sand mixing ritual is an opportunity to bring forward the idea that marriage is the intimate union of two people who nonetheless re remain distinct individuals after they marry. And so it simply consists in uh, each uh, spouse having a container that has sand of a particular color in it. And then as officiant, I hold a bigger container and they pour their sands into it in whichever way they like. So there are different patterns that can be obtained to symbolize the fact that they are becoming one but remaining individuals because the grains of, the grains of sand don't lose their original color. As far as where these ceremonies come from, there are all kinds of speculation, but I don't know if this one is true, but it's particularly interesting. The uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks work on these beautiful pieces of artwork. It takes them weeks using tiny little tools that look like straws and they put together these images using colored sand. And from my readings, the those sands are naturally colored, which I find particularly interesting. But then uh, Buddhists have this idea that everything is temporary, including life, 
And so after they finish these beautiful drawings, they have a ceremony where they just uh, scramble them and collect all the sand and go and dispose of the sand somewhere in a river to symbolize their return to nature. So there's a lot of symbolism in there and one can bring that into a ceremony to make it interesting. Well, as everything with the business of weddings, some people make money out of sand uh, mixing ceremonies. So you can buy these fancy containers and there's even a, a third container for the efficient. Now, as a matter of principle, I don't think I would accept pouring my sand on top of the spouse's sand. I think it's their wedding and my role is as a facilitator, not as part of really the integral part of the ceremony. Uh, if you want to get really fancy, you can buy these for an outrageous amount of money and have them engraved. Or you could use my approach, which is the rustic homemade thing using mason jars. So I performed such a ritual once at a ceremony and it was outside, it was a windy day and they had set up a nice table with flowers and various containers with sand and the wind was blowing and the tablecloths was flopping all over the place. So one has to plan this in a way that will uh, take into account the possibility of that kind of um, situation. An interesting variant on that I married a couple of scientists, two PhDs. One of them was a chemist, and uh, they proposed to have this uh, reaction. They call it a unity reaction. They provided me with the text that's, that's there. So it's the same idea. It talks about two individuals coming together and their lives and their families flowing together. So they're very nice ideas. And so the couple each has a, um, a glass that has a colorless liquid in it. And I was holding a bigger glass and then they poured their glass into mine and I was told to swirl and it remained colorless for about five seconds and then whoops, it, it just instantly turned dark blue. It involves starch and iodine for those of you who are chemically inclined and you can find a recipe on the web on how to make your own iodine clock reaction using fairly common reagents that you could obtain in a pharmacy or maybe a wine brewing store. A very short ritual that was kind of cute. Uh, those were computer geeks and they asked me towards the end of the ceremony after the exhortation uh, to add now change your Facebook status to married. And then they pulled out their cell phones and did that. And there were lots of computer geeks in the crowd, so they really appreciated that. Hand fasting. So Tibi has already mentioned that she performs hand fasting ceremonies using a Meti sash. So uh, that hand fasting as a tradition has been claimed by many different cultures, including Celtic pagans, Wiccans, various kinds of Christians. And here's uh, the prince and the princess uh, having their hand tied with the priest's um, garment, or the bishop, I should say. So uh, I was asked to do one of those by a couple who were of Scottish ancestry, and they had actually ordered a white sash with an embroidered uh, or emblazed coat of arms of the families. And uh, we conducted this long ceremony using the text straight out of Gail's rituals. And as you can see, it's pretty long. It was a hot day and I thought this was very long and interminable, but the feedback I had afterwards, people really enjoyed it. They thought it added a lot to the ceremony in terms of symbolism and all the things that we say each time an additional knot is tied one uh, repeats or, or says 
something else and the, the couple can participate and answer questions and so it, it's it's nice I was asked to do another one later in different circumstances um, the uh, bride was fairly ill and she could not stand up for very long it made her too tired so I created a much shorter version of that and um, some friends of the couple had prepared a braid made out of some material that had a lot of significance in the history of that couple so it added a very nice touch and it didn't take long at all and it, it was very nice I thought. So another thing that I've been asked to do once is a ring warning and so according to Gail's notes this comes from some cultures where they use the same rings for both the engagement and the wedding and so this ceremony is sort of a sign that the ring of engagement is being transformed into a, a ring of marriage. So it basically consists in passing the rings along the guests. Now when I did that, there were about 50 guests and it took very long because people didn't want to just take the ring and pass it on as if it were unimportant. So everybody spent quite a long time holding the ring and having some thoughts and smiling and it was great in terms of the emotions that were being expressed but it, it took a long time so our way to make the shorter that are suggested in the literature that I consulted uh, such as involving only the the wedding party or perhaps uh, putting the rings on a ribbon and then designating some rows in the audience that will um, touch the ring and send their good wishes to it. The last thing that I've been that I would like to talk about, I was once asked to do chanting rounds. I had no idea what that was and I found out while preparing this presentation that it's actually in Gail's notes also so that's probably where my couple had found this. So the idea is to ask everybody or as people who want in the audience in advance, so they were asked by the couple to write some phrases on small pieces of paper. And each person would then hand in their phrase. And at the very last minute, I would look those up and select four of them. And the couple had pre-selected four couples in the audience who were asked to come to the front and I would assign them one of the phrases and then there was a little rehearsal so uh, the first couple was asked to repeat their phrase four times and I did that with all the couples and then we did the something like a canon so as we do when we sing row 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 my boat and uh, we stagger the phrases. So the four couples start reciting their phrases and after the first couple finish their first uh, recitation, the second couple start theirs. So at the end, all four couples are reciting all their phrases simultaneously and you can still recognize what they're saying, but the words blend and it, it makes for a very nice effect. So I, I liked that and um, it worked out quite well. So apparently this is inspired from, from some Hindu traditions and uh, you're probably familiar with the chanting of the Hare Krishnas that they repeat the same phrase over and over and over again and uh, it enhances the, the emotions associated with those phrases. And then I was asked to finish this particular ritual by saying, I now ask all of you to repeat after me. We ask a blessing for this marriage. And blessing is one of these words that gets me going. So who are we asking the blessing from? And I thought there was a little bit of an ethical dilemma for me as a humanist officiant, but I reconciled it internally by saying they're, they're asking for a blessing by, by their parents and their friends 
and it's all right. We're not doing something that's not humanist. And on that note, I thank you for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you, Andre. And uh, uh, you've covered off some rituals we often uh, uh, in, encounter or request for. So are there any questions immediately for Andre um, at this point? Going once, going twice. Uh, on, okay. So I'm we'll hold off on questions. We'll come back to that. And uh, so we turn to our third presenter, uh, Ruth Henrik, to talk about some additional rituals. Thank you, Martin. Um, the, I'm going to start with the jumping of the broom. Um, the jumping of the broom has really ancient traditions. Some of them go as far back as the 15th, 16th century. Um, it is a centuries-old Welsh custom called Priodus Kozizgab, or the broomstick wedding. There, it also has origins in Ghana. The broom in Asante and other Akan cultures held spiritual values. And in the Americas, broom jumping was widely practiced among the slave communities as their only recognized form of marriage. When I've performed this, we have brought it forward to modern times, and it represents the threshold of the home. So jumping of the broom is symbolic of entering their new home together. Um, even if the couples are sharing a home or are currently married, and such as renewing the vows, jumping the broom can help symbolize entering a new stage of their relationship. There is also symbolism of sweeping away old energies and clearing away negativity. And it's a great usage in a wedding and helps the couple come together with a clean slate. This is usually done at the end of a ceremony. Um, the way I have done it is we have other people participating and it's usually somebody from the wedding party by retrieving a broom and laying it in front of the couple. And I explain to the audience what is happening, what it means, and get them involved because every, all of the guests yet to get to call one, two, three, jump as the couple jumps over the broom. So people can get really elated about that and there's a lot of hooting and hollering and it's quite a lot of fun. I've done this with contractors brooms. If the couple have a contracting business together or some, uh, even with janitors, they've brought a broom. Um, I've done this with people who have been very crafty and they have made the broom themselves or decorated a broom for this purpose. And I've done it with hockey sticks and baseball bats. So it can be made into anything that the couple wants uh, but it really is about jumping into the next part of their relationship. It takes about two to five minutes, depending on how elaborate and how much explanation the couple wants to go into. I usually find the shorter the better, because by that point in the ceremony, everybody wants to get to the party. Um, there are a few pitfalls that you should be aware of. One of them, if uh, somebody has gone to jump and stumbles, you could have somebody flat on their face or on their backside. Um, and that can be especially tricky with brides with long dresses. So there are a few little logistics about remembering to lift the dress or, you know, what do I do with my flowers now? That kind of stuff. So there are some logistics to that. The next ritual I would like to talk to you about is the wishing stones. Oh, pardon me. Wishing stones. And this, I live in an area that is close to a place called Big Bay, which is said to be the skipping stone capital of Canada. It's on Georgian Bay and the perfect skipping stones wash up on this shore. So this is very popular uh, with couples that I have worked with. 
and they make it a day and go to Big Bay and get the stones that they want. Uh, so they come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. They, it, what it represents is the couple who have come together have come from different paths and possibly even different destinations, but their love has brought them together and is joining that path into one. So think of a stone path is one of the symbolic pieces of this. Also, marriage needs to be built on a solid base. What is more solid than stone? And it gives the guests who are, you know, have these stones, um, it represents strength and endurance. There's a number of different ways that this can be incorporated into the ceremony, and I'll get into that in a moment. But one of the things I want to talk about is as people are holding the stone during the ceremony, it takes on the warmth of their hands. And it's said that the hopes and wishes for the couple are being absorbed during the ceremony as the warmth is being absorbed into that stone. And I think that's a really beautiful sentiment for the wishing stones. Also, the energy of a rock is said to be residual. So it continues to maintain that warmth for quite a long period of time, or if it's placed in water, it will get cold. Uh, one of the things that I found from one of the pagan traditions is that each stone stores a bit of history from everything and every person who has had it in their possession. So again, it's a really wonderful sentiment. Um, also using stones and rocks in part of your ceremony deals with solidity, stability, and being grounded. And they are representations of gravity. Of course, if you throw a rock in the air, it's going to come down. So the meaning of stones is synonymous with the passage of time. Think a rock of ages, and they reference dependability and permanence. I did find a bit of history about using the wishing stones, and it was in early Australia, the convicts and early settlers could not have formed the normal symbolic presentation of rings at a wedding ceremony. So to confirm their vows, instead of a ring or rings being given and received, each of the persons being married would cast a stone into a nearby river or the ocean, symbolizing their remaining together while the tides of time ebb and flow. Um, it can also symbolize the merging of past cultures. I ran across one where using colored stones and then they are etched with rune symbols and each symbol has a specific meaning. So the couple can go through those type of symbols and see what resonates with them. So there are many, many different ways of doing this. You, they can have the stones as their guests enter, they pick up a stone, they may have a permanent marker available and each guest can write a wish on it, um, longer wishes depending on the size of the stones, if they're smaller stones, one word. Uh, there are some logistics that need to be sorted out in advance of doing this ritual and it really comes down to at what point do you want to do this during the ceremony? Are the stones going to be collected for the couple or are they going to be thrown into water? I have done this a few times. Um, raw, uh, weddings on docks are very popular in, our, in my area. So the wedding party is on the dock and they have each done a, a wish on their stone and they are laid out on the dock in advance of the ceremony. And then at, uh, after they have said their vows, all of the wedding party and the couple turn around, pick up their rocks and throw them into the lake. And of course, afterward, everybody has time, has fun, you know, diving into the lake, trying to find the rocks. Um, the other way of doing it is to have them collected. Again, it's a way of getting the wedding party involved by going around and collecting the rocks, and then they are brought forward and presented to the couple 
as being all of the wishes and goodwill from their guests for their marriage. And it's quite beautiful. So it's, there's so much symbolism that goes, uh, that can be a part of this. Um, when the rocks are thrown into the water, the guests are asked to watch the ripples. And the reason for that is by having the rock hit the water, it causes a change. And that change is a very simple and single act, but of course the ripples extend out. So the act of the couple getting married on that day is also said to have a ripple effect within their own community. Um, I've had some guests who have asked their, or sorry, some couples who have asked the guests to hang on to their rocks. And then as they enter the reception area to deposit them into a box and it becomes a very nice keepsake. Um, there has also been a couple that I worked with where all of the guests were asked to write a song title on their rock. And as they entered the reception area, they were dropped in a box. And those were the songs that were played by the DJ for the evening. So you can see there's a lot of creativity that can go into this. Um, I even did one on the edge of a cliff um, on the Niagara Escarpment. Um, and it was an, an area where there was no trails below us. So it was all private land. And this was the couple, it was very important to them that they symbolize something. So each of the guests had written a one word wish on a rock and they were just random rocks that the couple had picked up around the property. And then at the end of the, uh, the ceremony, everybody went to the edge of the cliff and threw their rocks over. So it was really quite beautiful. Some of the pitfalls of the wishing stones is some throws can go wrong. And uh, I've seen a few, especially children, where the rock ends up behind them instead of in front of them. And in one instance, the box that the stones were in were too heavy to carry. <laughs> so, just a few little things to remember. The next ritual I'd like to speak to you about is hand ceremony. Uh, the hand ceremony is, it can be placed in several locations during the ceremony itself. Uh, right after the declaration of intention, it can be part of the ring warming or it can be part of the vows. The hands are arguably the most used part of our body, at least I think they are. The hands are considered in some cultures a connection to the heart and symbolically it brings two hearts together. Um, two, two hands that hold, they can appreciate how they will change, how each person, person will grow and mature over the life of their marriage through the actions they take with their hands. And it can be seen as a ritual to draw the couple closer together. Um, it's a moment to take note of the moment. So it gets people to slow down a little and just really appreciate who these people are to each other. And the hands symbolize strength, power, protection, generosity, hospitality, and stability. Um, it also reminds the couple of what it was like when they first held, held hands which sometimes gets a little forgotten, especially on a day when so many things are going on. It's really quite beautiful as part of the ring exchange where the couple hold hands, one holds the other's hands, palms up, and we talk about what their hands are to each other. And they, it can just run the gamut of whatever is important to them. And then the ring, a ring is brought forward by usually somebody in the wedding party given to the person who is holding the hands and they place a ring on the other person's finger and of course do the vice versa for the other one. It's really quite beautiful. My favorite part of the ritual is what is said at the end of it. And this is how it goes. May your hands always be held by one another. Give them the strength to hold on during the storms of stress and the dark of disillusionment. 
Keep them tender and gentle as you nurture each other in your wondrous love. Help these hands to continue building a relationship rich and caring and devoted to one another. May you see these hands as healer, protector, shelter, and guide. I think it's one of my most beautiful rituals. I actually did it at my wedding. So maybe I'm a little biased there. Um, as far as pitfalls, I don't really think there are any in that, in that ritual. The ceremony of the wooden box. This one is known as the anniversary box, the fight box, or the wine and spirit box. You do need a bottle of something, um, usually wine, and make sure that it's a bottle that's going to age well. Uh, two glasses, but the most endearing part of this are the love letters that the couple writes to each other. And they will determine when they are going to open this box. I've also encouraged couples that I've worked with who have done this ritual to put mementos of their relationship in there. Things such as some, something maybe from their first date, playbills, concert tickets, you know, things that people collect over time. There's, there's even been baby booties that they put in there um, of their child who had been born just months before the ceremony. Um, this, the symbolism of this ritual is a symbol of their commitment. They decide when they are going to open this box. This box can be there on, uh, they could do it every, every year on the anniversary of the day they got married. They may decide to do it every five years or 10 years. Um, but it can also be a life preserver during rough times where they would take this box, open it, share the wine or spirit, and read the letters of what their relationship was on the day that they got married and why they are together. So it's quite a beautiful sentiment that goes with this. This can be done, it doesn't have to be a wooden box. It can be, you can get those really nice cloth um, covered ones that you can find at HomeSense or Winners. Uh, they can have locks and keys. I've had couples do them with antique boxes that they have found. Um, if there is a lock and a key, you can make it fun by having something random happen as to who gets to hold the key. Um, sometimes, actually I've had it done a couple of times where it's been given to a father to hold the key which means if you're ever in trouble, you've got to go to dad. Um, this is also something that can be adapted if there is a blended family or even just in the uh, couple is getting married after they've already had their family, where it becomes a family box. You don't necessarily have to fill it with wine or spirits, but mementos from their family time together or things that they, they can write letters to each other and put them in, and then they can make this an annual event where the family reads the letters that they wrote the year before and writes new letters, and it becomes a diary of the relationship with the family. So it can, be, it can become the family box. So the only pitfall I can see on this one, anything having to do with hammers and nails can be a problem but they can also be quite fun. The last one I want to acknowledge is the memorial. And the memorial is to acknowledge someone close to the couple who has died. I've been privileged enough to work with some couples where a parent has died um, not too far in advance of the ceremony being performed. So it's very important that they acknowledge that parent Sometimes it's a grandparent, or sometimes it's been a sibling or a very close friend. Um, I've even had it where there is a space in the wedding party for one of the groomsmen who had died. So it's, and it's important to acknowledge that and to bring some significance. And it's very calming for everyone. The memorial can be done with flowers or candles. I've had couples who have 
had a picture and they put it on a chair. And then during the memorial part of the ceremony, they place flowers on that chair. And it's really quite touching. Um, I've had the picture of the person that is placed on the signing table and then flowers or a candle are lit there. Um, with outdoor, outdoor ceremonies, it is extremely important to put the candle into a lantern or it will blow out. And people are disappointed when it blows out. <laughs> so just make sure there's a lantern available. Um, there are many lovely poems that can be said, especially during the time when movement is happening during the memorial of the couple either going to the table to light the candle, uh, during the lighting of a candle or placing of flowers. Um, and there are examples of that um, in, the Google, in the Google folder in this memorial ritual you will find. So some of the pitfalls of this are the candles can get blown out, dresses can get in the way, especially if there are very small spaces. Um, and the couple needs to, to decide who's going to do the lighting. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little bit of a tussle up there. He wants to do it, she wants to do it, so you have to decide in advance. And it is definitely do not use matches, use a barbecue lighter try and take out all of those things that are going to go wrong and let it run smoothly. So that is my presentation. Um, I hope you have uh, gotten a few things out of that. And if you have any questions, I'd like to hear them. Okay, well, thank you, Ruth. And, uh, and to Tibby and Andre, um, you've all provided us some uh, uh, a wealth of resources and interesting takes on how we might modify rituals. Uh, one of the things I'm taking away from all of you right now is uh, how these rituals need to be uniquely tailored to each of um, uh, to each of the couples that we're we're collaborating with, so that they have these nuances uh, that are reflective of the couple. Um, so, uh, can, I, can I just jump in here for a second, Martin? Of course. Thank you. Um, there are other rituals that are in the Google folder as well, and the Google folder is called the OHSHC webinars. Um, there is one there on candlelighting, the circle of love, uh, parental honoring, quilt wrapping, roses for both either the mothers or the couple, Sailor's Knot, Chocolate Ceremonies, Wine Ceremonies, Lover's Knot, The Oathing Stone, which is one of my personal favorites again, The Salt Ceremony, which is a very ancient tradition, Unity Bouquets, Wedding Teas, un um, I guess I've Unity Bouquet in twice, um, Jewish Wedding Traditions, there's two of them that I had, the one is called The Seven Blessings, and the other one, of course, is The Breaking of the Glass, and then The Tree Planting Ritual. So, thank you. Okay, so uh, this is an opportunity for uh, any uh, uh, attendees to be asking questions. And uh, so at the bottom of your screen, you could certainly put up your hand um, and uh, we could open the mic for you or you can use the question box. And are there, let me ask a question to those in attendance as well, given the, uh, 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 in addition to the um, rituals that our presenters have talked about, are there rituals that uh, any of our attendees have used that are not on the list uh, or were covered by the presenters? Um, and again, looking to expand the repertoire. Ah, so we have a couple. So uh, Tracy, uh, let me open up the mic for you and uh, you're live, Tracy. Hello. So yes, uh, I did a wedding in a very, very large backyard. It was basically a field and there was a uh, a bonfire there after the ceremony. So it's kind of like the wishing stone ceremony is I brought um, uh, wood chips, like fairly large wood chips, 
a huge bag of them to the to the ceremony and all the guests were asked to pick one out and to make a wish for the couple on it and then to throw it in the fire and there were enough of these chips that they could do this you know all night long whenever whenever they they had another thought that they wanted to 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 give to the couple this just went on all night long and people seemed to really enjoy it oh well thank you tracy Um, so not to be done in a condo. Uh, no. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, John Manuel. Am I unmuted? You're unmuted, John. Thank you. Okay. Just very briefly, um, a short container, a small container of red wine, a small container of white wine, and the two are mixed together in a common glass, and the couple drink from that common glass, signifying the blending of two different natures, two different personalities, uh, one light, one dark. There's a lot of symbolism that you can use, uh, daytime, nighttime, and so forth. Uh, I, I've used that uh, a small number of times. Okay, thank you, John. Now there is a question here uh, from Sylvia, and I and I think the uh, the the focus of looking at rituals during uh, this particular webinar were uh, were rituals that one might use uh, in weddings, uh, but Sylvia has asked a question. Um, does anyone have ceremonies on housewarmings? And so uh, let me put that out to uh, our presenters. Tibby, Ruth, Andre. I have not done the housewarming ceremony. No, I haven't either. I've been to housewarming ceremonies, long, like, but it's usually just a big party. <laughs> Nobody's really paying attention to anything else. <laughs> okay, Tibby? So we do have uh, what we call a, a, a cleansing ceremony. And I think that's very similar to what you're talking about. But in, in our culture, in my culture, we do a, uh, a ceremony to cleanse the house, to welcome, to welcome the new dwellers and we use uh, sweet grass or we use cedar for that ceremony. And it's really quite beautiful. You can probably find a, a local elder or a traditional person wherever it is you're living that would do that kind of a ceremony for you or explain that ceremony for you. It's quite beautiful. Oh, thank you, Tibby. Now, Susanne asked a question. Um, uh, for the presenters. Thank you for a great presentation. Would any of the panelists happen to know of the legalities of performing a ceremony that involves drinking wine? Is just a small ceremony amount of alcohol permitted even at a non-licensed establishment? Does the officiant have to be smart, serve, certified? I've asked this question a couple of times but haven't found a consistent answer. Um, I, I, I think it's easier to get forgiveness than it is to get permission. <laughs> a, a good answer. Um, I, I can say that I have incorporated uh, the wine cup ceremony and numerous ceremonies. Uh, and uh, uh, it's interesting. Uh, maybe I'm just not so much a law abiding person, but uh, um, yes, I definitely wouldn't worry about the smart serve and I think you're good. And uh, there's a, a lot of lenience given to anything that's considered a ceremonial element. And uh, um, so. Good, mine is uh, about uh, sharing the first glass of wine. And it's, it's short and I, I, it's one of my favorites and it says, the pleasant taste and effervescence of this wine is the result of careful and patient aging. Wine improves with age. Also, 
through care and patience. May your love and friendship grow stronger as the years go by. Many days you will sit at the same table to eat and drink together. Share this glass of wine as you will share future joys and successes and the couple drinks the wine. You notice I got choked up there. I love that one. <clears throat> um, thank you, Jim. There we go. So are there any other questions? I think that uh, we have... Uh, I think that's... Tracy, Tracy Bigger had uh, answered Sasan's question that if the wine is not being sold, then you would not need smart serve. The same rules would apply as it would at a private party. Uh, has anyone done a child naming ceremony? Yes. Okay. And... Uh, so, I, I have answered that uh, on the chat, but or on the question and answers. But uh, I've done one, and if anyone is interested interested in having my tech, just email me and I'll send it to you. It was fun. Uh, the baby, do we, the baby uh, vomited on her beautiful dress about two minutes before the ceremony, so they had to go and put her in jammies and bring her back without their beautiful dress. Uh, thank you, Andre. Are there uh, some uh, child naming ceremonies in the, uh, the, uh, the package on the Google Drive? No, it concentrated on the weddings. Uh, child namings have, is not included in this one. Okay. Um, so in my case, I found something on the internet, but I, I spent about an hour with the couple deciding what we were going to do. They had some pretty set ideas about what they wanted, and uh, it ended up being very interesting. We had, um, instead of godparents, we had another word for it. Guide parents? No. Mentors. Mentors. Mentors? No. Yes. yes, mentors. Something that sounded like godparent, but it was not God. Anyway, it was great. Yeah, John tried. Manuel said that he has performed quite a, performed a few of them yeah. as well. But I still have all my texts somewhere. Okay. And I think one of the items that we had, and it might be related to not so much child namings, but the incorporation of children into a marriage ceremony. Um, and I don't know whether any of uh, the panelists would like to address that. Uh, so, for instance, I'm thinking of uh, a ceremony where it's it's going to be it's a blended family. One of the partners has a as a child, and uh, and and uh, they're being acknowledged in the ceremony as well. Yeah, I did one. I've done a few of them. Of course, the sand ceremony goes a long way to including children and they love pouring sand and the messier, the better. I did it with a couple that had uh, seven children. Um, so it was a blended family, seven children all together. So it was, it was quite a bit of fun. Um, there's also been, I used an oathing stone with this couple so they had their oathing stone, but uh, her daughter also had an oathing stone and was part of the vow exchange. And she received a, a small gift from her stepfather then. So there are a number of different ways of bringing children into it. Okay. Um. Oh, and I just remembered, the, it was guide parents. Yes. There we go. Thank you, Andre. Um, John Jackson has a question. Uh, a word of caution involving children, you can imagine. Ooh. Oh, John, sorry. Um, we, we missed that. Uh, children can uh, 
introduce uh, new elements unexpectedly. Uh, and so um, uh, I made the mistake of, uh, well, we had a young fellow who was only <laughs> maybe four years old, maybe five, um, who had the rings um, that were to be presented uh, during the ceremony. Uh, and so I thought uh, in a moment of, uh, uh, I, I don't know why I asked him, I don't know, I wasn't part of the ceremony or anything. I just said, I asked him, uh, and young, young sir, um, how many rings are in that box? And he proudly announced to everyone, President, that there were four rings in the box. Uh, and so I said, very interesting, knowing, of course, there were only two rings. And um, uh, and I uh, said, well, uh, what I will do is I, I will take two rings for now. And he said, that would be fine. And so uh, we carried on. But everyone nearly laughed their heads off because when he said it was the ref he didn't look himself, of course, or check anything himself. He just assumed there, were, for some reason, that there would be four rings. So you have to be sure that the children actually know what is going on and don't introduce a new element that could throw everything off. Right. Thank you, John. So I think that's it for questions. Uh, so unless there are any final words from our panelists, um, let me turn it over to uh, Matt Bin. Hey, everyone. So um, thank you to all the presenters. A, a wealth of information, uh, a lot of great uh, uh, and very useful content. So thank you to all three of you for providing your experience and your knowledge to this, uh, to this group. I want to comment briefly on the wider picture of why we include rituals in our ceremonies. For a couple of millennia, um, rituals for weddings were, uh, some, some religious groups had cornered the market on that and were fairly new. <clears throat> and we find that couples come to us often asking, what is it we're supposed to do? What is our wedding supposed to look like? Because although they know they don't want a religious ceremony, they want something that uh, provides that same feeling, uh, that same resonance uh, with them, with their family, with everybody present. And they want to make their wedding celebration uh, uh, real. They want to make it really important. We have a very important role. And in being able to provide a, a lot of different rituals, uh, a lot of different variations on each of those rituals that the couple themselves will will uh, appreciate, will uh, enjoy, and will will really, um, oh, and here's my beagle, uh, Pearl, who's come to join me at this point. Thank you, Pearl. Um, <clears throat> that the couple will find enriches their, cer their ceremony, their, their wedding experience. So it's not to be taken lightly, these, these rituals, these little extras that we add to the wedding. Uh, there are lots of, blended families and new families and different configurations of families that will find something really special in these rituals. They will find a way to express what the joy and the togetherness that they're feeling at this time. And uh, our ability to provide these, uh, the, these uh, very important and very special uh, um, ways of celebrating are really important. And it also helps to contextualize the marriage. Uh, Tibby talked about the, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, land acknowledgements and other ceremonies that tie us to our country's history and not the history that we've kind of, uh, well, again, white guys have kind of cornered the market on history for the last couple of centuries. And maybe it's time that uh, we learned a little more about what actually uh, we come from and what actually shaped the, the, the world that we live in. And bringing these things in is of utmost importance. Because we can't stand on texts, we can't stand on dogma, we have to turn back to the people. And that's what these ceremonies are really about. These rituals are really about people involved and how they express what they need to express. So I really encourage everybody. I know it can be a little daunting sometimes to do a ritual you haven't done before. Uh, it can be a little unsettling to bring in these elements that maybe you haven't seen even. And maybe you're just going off a text that you've got from somebody else. And that's okay. You know, uh, part of our role as an efficient is to 
to sell the thing. It's not just to celebrate, but to sell. We're, we're putting ourselves out there and putting the couple out there and making it real. And so I really encourage everyone to look over the materials that are provided, to take advantage of the knowledge of the three presenters and all your other officiants around you who have uh, performed, uh, um, performed these ceremonies and these rituals in the past, and find ways to make the ceremonies that you perform that much more special for the couples that you are performing them for. Um, we've got a lot of resources, we've got a lot of knowledge in our two organizations and uh, all of us are in this to share and to lift everybody else up. So don't be afraid to ask. Uh, we have our own um, discussion forums. We have, we're going to be sharing a lot of materials in the, the uh, Google Drive. And it's worth spending some time reading through them, learning, uh, and, and finding the things that resonate with us as well as might resonate with couples. And by working together, we can make humanist ceremonies that much better and that much more uh, 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 fulfilling that important service that we all fulfill as humanist efficients. Um, it's not to be taken lightly, the service that we, ha that we do fulfill to, uh, to people in our communities. Um, we fill a gap that hasn't been filled before. Uh, life ceremonies, as I said, religions have kind of cornered the market on those. And it's really time that we uh, made it about the people involved and not texts that uh, may or may not have relevance to people's lives today. So um, this webinar has been a real good start. Uh, for all of that. And I hope we all will take the, uh, the initiative to continue that work, to increase our abilities as efficients. And as always, you're welcome to reach out to myself, to Ruth, to Martin, uh, our, my counterparts at Humanist Canada, and to uh, uh, really make our best efforts as efficients. Um, I encourage everyone to do so. I really do deeply thank Martin and Ruth for helping to make this uh, um, this webinar series a reality. Um, OHS is uh, an enthusiastic and very grateful partner in this uh, webinar effort, and I'm looking forward to the next ones. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight. So, um, thank you. Matt, uh, again to our presenters, Tibby Johnson, Andre Lachance, Ruth Henrik. Uh, this has been a wonderful evening, but may you all um, have a good evening, take care of one another, and uh, be safe. Uh, have, a, have a good evening and a good week, and we'll look forward to uh, regrouping next month. Thank you all, and good night. Good night, all. Good night, everyone. Thanks Thank for you. joining us, and thanks, Martin, for all your help. Bum bum pee. Bye bye. Bye.